welcome to day two of Horrorcon UK. Hope you're all enjoying yourselves. Uh, how many of you were here yesterday? Quite a few, and we've got quite a few newcomers. Uh, we'll be uh, we'll be mixing it up a little bit today. We'll repeat some of the stuff we did um, uh, during the interview yesterday, but we'll have uh, some some new material for those of you that were here yesterday. So it's uh, it's not going to be the same interview all over again. Anyway, my name's Daryl Buxton. Um, I'm uh, uh, um, I've been a horror writer and horror critic for over 30 years, about 35 years and um, uh, I was uh, fortunate to be invited here last year to interview Ian McCulloch and Kane Hodder and yesterday we had a really really great session with the man that you're about to see um, for the next 30 minutes or so. Um, he's uh, he's um, one of those people who's become an overnight star after 50 years in the business and um, we'll be talking about his recent successes and delving into the uh, the, um, uh, the history of his career and the stuff that he did right back to the 1960s. So without further ado, will you please welcome the amazing Mr. Sid Haig. Just said, Sid. We'll uh, we'll run through some of the same stuff that we did yesterday, but uh, there'll be there, we'll put a new spin on it as well for the the people that, that have, have seen you twice. So you get residuals for the stuff that we did yesterday, or uh... take it up with the organisers. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, yesterday we spoke um, at length about your work on uh, Rob Zombie's uh, House of a Thousand Corpses and Devil's Rejects, um, and. Uh, um, one thing I wanted to ask, which I didn't ask yesterday, Rob, Rob's a huge fan of the Marx Brothers and of course named a lot of the characters in those movies after characters that Groucho Marx had played. Um, were you aware of Groucho's Captain Spaulding? Oh um, yeah. Yeah, yes. and um, from, from the movie Animal Crackers of course. And did Groucho influence you in any way? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, he's much nicer than Captain Spaulding. Okay. But uh, did Rob say anything on on set or at the script stage about about the whole Marx Brothers thing? He mentioned it. Yeah, we got into it a little bit, and uh, he, you know, just explained his his love for the Marx Brothers and got Groucho, and um, that was kind of the spirit behind these characters. We we just took the characters from. Animal characters and made them bad. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, sticking with Rob, uh, his his movies do get a, a mixed reaction from fans. It's fair to say, but uh, I think no one can deny that um, his films do have a very distinct and personal style. And I know that you you've said in interviews previously how much of a fan you are of uh, his uh, Halloween remake. And um, you played uh, Chester Chesterfield in in uh, Halloween. Um, uh, uh, how how does Rob differ from other horror directors? Do you, do you, does, do you think he does have a, a very distinct and personal style to his work? He does, and he fell in love with uh, horror in the 70s, okay? So he's kind of, all of his work is kind of a return to the 70s style horror film. And uh, he, he tries to stay true to that, but at the same time update it uh, so that uh, you know it's it's relevant to what's going on now. Um, as far as Halloween, I personally I was so pleased to get the background story of Michael Myers, so we now understand why this guy is a freaking idiot running around <laughs> killing people. Okay, and a terrible childhood, kind of. <laughs> Okay, now you mentioned briefly yesterday that uh, Captain Spaulding made a very, very brief return in Rob's animated film, uh, Haunted, Haunted World of El Super Bisto. Yeah. Um, and of course you, uh, you supplied the, uh, the, the voice, the dialogue for, for the captain. Um, when did you, it's only a very, very brief moment in the film, when, when did you actually record that? Was that done on, on the set of Devil's Rejects or something, or were you called in later? No, that was, that was uh, done much later. The, the animation 
for the film, film El Super Bisto, was done in Korea, and uh, they were having a kind of a translation problem, and they were getting things messed up, so it just took forever to do. And Rob just gave me a call and said, "We just come and do this," and so we recorded it in a in a studio, and that was that. And as you said yesterday, it had to be you. And no, no one else could do Captain Spaulding. Unfortunately for them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're going to cover something now that you, you uh, talked about in some detail yesterday, but it's, it's worth retelling. Um, I think everyone here would, would agree that the, the final scene of Devil's Rejects is absolutely stunning. Um, wordless, but unforgettably set to Freebird by Leonard Skinner. Um, and I'd say it's one of the greatest finales to any modern horror movie. Um, did Rob tell the cast what music was going to be used on the soundtrack? And did he give you any special instructions for the scene? Originally, the, that song was supposed to be Black Betty. Okay. And he said, no, I don't think so. I want to do Freebird. And the producers and backers said, are you crazy? That's seven minutes long. What are you going to do for seven minutes? He said, that's up to me. So uh, he devised that last scene uh, with us driving into our death, basically. And there was really no special inf uh, instructions. It was just, you know, you're fighting for your life. You're going to kill as many cops as you can before they get you. Um, and the thing was interesting, scary, but interesting. Um, Sherry had never been around guns in her life, okay? So she and I are in the back seat. The first time I raised that shotgun and fired a shot, I saw her in my periphery just fall back into the seat. And I said, oh my God, the shell hit her. No, the shell ejects this way, not that way. And it was just, the sound was so deafening that it just drove her right into her seat. And so we decided that uh, she needed a little experience. So um, Kane Hodder, who was the um, stunt coordinator on the film, took her off to the side and just had her fire off round after round after round so she got used to the feeling and the sound and the craziness of the whole thing. And then she really got into it and kind of turned a little nuts herself. So, um, but that was, you know, that was it. Okay, what did you think when you first saw that scene cut together? I I was I was taken by it. Okay, the first first of all, nobody is ever going to listen to Freebird the same again, <laughs> right? I mean, it just uh, it has that impact, and the idea of hearing the three heartbeats, and then two heartbeats, and then one heartbeat, and then no heartbeats. It was pretty dramatic, I think. Don't you? Yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, we didn't really talk much yesterday about um, your work in TV, and you've appeared in all kinds of cult TV shows, Star Trek, Batman, and so on. Um, we're going to talk um, uh, in some detail about Jason of, of Star Command later, your, your big hit show, but uh, take us back to the 60s and some of those uh, sort of bit parts in what have now become uh, really, really iconic cult shows. Uh, yeah, I... Um... <laughs> I started in 1961, okay, in Jack Hill's um, student film at UCLA uh, called The Host, which is now a companion disc to his Switchblade, uh, Switchblade Sisters, okay. Uh, and then I just started getting television work like crazy. Man. My first television show was the original Untouchables with Robert Stack, um, and I was uh, as a novice. I made a lot of mistakes, you know. I, my first inter interview I went to, I had a book of my pictures, and um, the casting director flipped through the pictures and said, "I'm sorry, we don't have anything for you." And I, I defended the photographer. I said, "Excuse me, but the photographer put all of his time and effort and talent into those pictures, and you just flipped through that like it was the phone book." take a look at those pictures, okay? And she took a look, a little better look, and it's, still don't have anything for you. Okay. But 
later she became my champion. She cast me in everything that she did. Uh, four gun smokes, um, uh, get smart. She was doing three or four different shows and she just, I, I think she appreciated the fact that I spoke out for myself and I was actually defending somebody else. So um, she was very nice to me. Yeah. And um, I stumbled my way through and, and all of a sudden I just started getting more and more work and more and more work. And um, there was a TV series called Batman. And everybody in Hollywood was trying to get into Batman. And uh, it just so happened, out of the blue, this doesn't happen often, but every night of the week, I was starring in a different TV series. Okay, and so I had to take out an ad. I said, this, I can't let this just go away, okay? But I took out an ad in the Variety and the Hollywood Reporter starring Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And the producer of Batman said, why is this guy doing everybody else's show but mine? Get his ass in here tomorrow, okay? <laughs> and so the call was made and I went in and he handed me the script. He said, go in that room and read the script and whatever part you want beside King Tut, it's yours, okay? Well, okay, good. That's <laughs> I love it. And so that's how I wound up on that show. Okay. Well, let's take you forward to the end of the 70s now and more TV. Your, your, your big TV hit, which was playing the, uh, the villain, Dragos, in uh, Jason, of, Jason of Star Command. How did all that come about? How did you get cast in that? This is a perfect example of, saying, of never saying never, okay? Because the one thing I said was, well, I'll never do a kid's show. <laughs> Saturday morning, here it is, Sid Haig on Jason of Star Command. Um, went in for the interview, everything went well, and I was supposed to be a big, imposing character. Well, the guy who played uh, Jason, Craig Littler, and I are both the same height, and I had to be bigger. So guess who got the six-inch platform boots to walk around in? Yeah. <laughs> And uh, they had just developed that technology of the AB uh, compound that makes foam, okay? And this was terrible. I was uh, lying down on a table and they stuck a, a tube from a, a, paper towel, a, a paper towel dispenser in my mouth so I could breathe and wrapped my head in saran wrap and then poured this stuff over my head and it looked like I had fallen asleep under a cow. Okay, um, and, then, and then when it hardened, they cut enough away so that they could lift it off of me and created that helmet, which was only like a quarter of an inch thick. And um, it, it was an amazing piece. I have not seen this myself, and I don't have absolute confirmation, but I was told that the costume from that is now in the Smithsonian Institute. Yeah, so there we go. My costume is more famous than me. <laughs> okay, let's uh, stick with the 70s and uh, go right back to the start of the decade because uh, you worked with George Lucas on, you appeared in um, THX 1138. Yes, yes, that was very strange. Uh, they uh, rented a, a rehearsal hall. I was in the, that section of the film where they were in limbo, which is kind of a futuristic jail, okay? and. It was the largest psych uh, studio in, in, in the world, actually. It was like half the size of a football field. And the radius from the wall down to the floor was four feet. So it was uh, uh, this big scooping thing that went from the wall to the floor. And the entire ceiling was 300 watt photo floods a half an inch away from one another. So the entire ceiling was light and bouncing off the white floor there were no shadows okay which is kind of strange you know you expect to see shadows around and um, so when we started this rehearsal process George would come in in the morning and he'd say okay I want you guys to work on something like this 
and then he would leave. Then he'd come back in the afternoon and say, okay, show me what you got. And so, okay, and so we showed him what we worked out. He said, okay, that's good. And he tweaked it a little bit here and a little bit there. And the next morning we did the same thing all over again. He gave us another assignment and then came back in the afternoon. So that's how that whole limbo situation took place. Uh, and then we took a week to shoot it. It was, it was amazing. And, and he had five cameras working, everything from a nine millimeter lens to a thousand millimeter lens. And we did it all in one take because the cameras were covering everybody from every angle. It was amazing. It was tough, very tough for him to cut together, which was uh, also amazing because he actually started life out as a, a, an editor but he could not edit that thing together the way that he wanted it to. Now, when, when Star Wars came along a few years later, there was no, never any suggestion that you might be in that. He no. didn't come back for you for that. No, I don't know why. Because I had to step on his foot or something, I don't know. Okay, now let's bring you uh, right forward to, uh, to recent times. And um, I'm sure everyone agrees, one of, one of the best horror movies of the last couple of years was um, um, S. Craig Zahler's um, Bone Tomahawk and um, uh, Sid of course appears um, in, the, uh, in the opening scene, the, uh, the um, uh, pre-credit scene of that. So uh, tell us a bit about your experiences on uh, Bone Tomahawk, Sid. That was an amazing film to work on, yeah. It, uh, uh, David uh, Arquette was uh, great to work with, we had good chemistry together and um, we were ad-libbing a lot of stuff, okay? But trying to stay to the script as much as possible. But because of the situation, the, the ground was giving way every time we'd take a step because of the, the earth was all powdery and everything was like slipping on ice. Um, but uh, <laughs> it was also like well over 100 degrees and I was wearing that big heavy coat and the hat and the whole thing. It was like it was extremely tiring. I was the first one on the set before the sun rose we didn't finish until the sun set. And to show you what a classy guy he is and what the production company is, I went to him and I said, you know, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it home. And he said, don't worry, just get changed. When I got changed and came out of my dressing room, they had a guy there waiting for me, drove me home in my car. And when we got to my house, there was a taxi cab waiting for him to take him back to the set. That's classy stuff. That's that's 1940s style of, of operating. Style. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was very cool. Okay, um, we're going to take some questions from the audience in the last uh, 10 minutes or so of the session. So uh, if anyone's got a question for Sid, uh, raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone round. So. Uh, any questions? One, one in the front there. Hello. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask, is there anything that you're working on in the near future that we can look forward to seeing you in that you can tell us? I have four films in various stages of editing right now, Brilliant. okay? One is Death House. I think that's been yeah. advertised heavily, okay? Another is a film called Cynthia, which is very scary. Uh, and another film called High on the Hog, which I, I really am anticipating the, the release of because it, it, it has great relevance in terms of what's happening at least in America right now. Um, it's a family uh, film. Uh, I play a farmer whose farm has been in the family for five generations. And I promised my father that I would not sell out to corporate farmers, okay? And, but things get a little tough, so I start growing a little herb in between the <laughs> corn. <laughs> Gotta make a living! Uh, <laughs> and along the way, I, I find these three women that have been terribly abused in one way or another, and I take them in as family. So we are this family that's operating together. So the film becomes like a family film, but we're doing a little dancing around. Uh, <laughs> things are going swell uh, until the uh, drug enforcement shows up. <laughs>
and then everything just kind of turns to shit. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm really kind of proud of that film. I was signed to play the leading role in the film. And after over 50 years of, of working in this business, when you the first time you step out, step out onto the set, you get an idea of what the rest of the shoot is gonna be like, okay? And I saw the crew who were young, energetic, film students, theater arts majors. They really wanted to do a good job. They were all excited. They just didn't know what their job was. So I went to the executive producer and I said, you know, you, get, you need to get a producer in here with some organizational skills to teach these kids what it is that they need to know because they really want to do a good job for you. And he said, well, will you do it? And I went, Call my agent. <laughs> so the next day I was a producer and held a three and a half hour production meeting with all the department heads, got them all headed in the right direction. And the next day it was like we hired a whole new crew. It, all they needed was just a little direction to get them going, in the, you know, and, 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 it, and it worked. Um, so I'm very excited to, to see how this film turns out. And then I did another film, which is based in the UK, um, called Abruptio, and uh, it's kind of interesting. I do the voice of one of the characters because the entire film is shot with life-size marionettes. <laughs> That's about. Okay, so uh, that's the four films that I have in the can right now, and I'm doing two more films this summer, along with another eight or ten conventions. I don't know. I'm crazy. <laughs> Busy man. Um, I felt sorry all weekend for you guys over here in the shadows. So let's see if we've got a question over this side. One, one right up at the back there. From the darkness. <laughs> Where were we? Yeah. Yeah. Where are we? Hiya. Hello. Um, out of all the directors that you've worked with, have you got a favorite director? I have three favorite directors. Quentin Tarantino, Rob Zombie, and Jack Hill. And the reason for that is because they're smart. They make their vision clear to you, they know, so that you know exactly what they're looking for and then they get the hell out of the way and let you do your job. Uh, there are too many directors out there that are puppet masters and you know, say, okay, now when you say this, lift your right hand and then, you know, turn to the right and, and stop, please. Take the strings off me and just let me do my job. And that's what they do and that's why I appreciate them and will do anything for them. Thank you. Okay, any uh, question here? Yeah. Hi Sid, nice to meet you. Um, what was it like working with Lon Chaney Jr. on Spider Baby? That was absolutely amazing because when I was a kid, on Saturday afternoons I would go to the theater and watch Lon Chaney Jr. play the Wolfman. And now all of a sudden I'm on a set working with him. I couldn't even speak for the first two days. I couldn't even speak to him. Um, but um, it was a very small crew, and at one point they needed him, and uh, Jack Hill said, Sid, will you go get Lon Chaney because we need him in this scene? So I went and I knocked on his dressing room door, and Mr. Chaney, and he opened the door and he said, stop that. We're in this film together. My name is Lon, your name is Sid. Let's leave it that way, okay? And he was so giving and so kind and generous with his time. Uh, it was amazing. A beautiful man. He basically became my mentor. He taught me what to do, not what uh, what not to do, the mistakes not to make, um, because he made them all. <laughs> so he knew uh, it was just a, an amazing experience. And we just thought we were making a little film. Okay, we had absolutely no idea. This year, I think, is the 50th anniversary of that film. Um, so I was I was blessed by being able to be in his presence for 11 days. Um, also, I saw on um, Twitter the other day, Rob Zombie invited you out for lunch with Sherry and Bill Mosley. 
Is it possible that he's talking to you about a prequel, The House of House of Corpses, or a sequel, Devil's Rejects? We have, we have no idea, okay? And even if I knew and I told you, he would shoot me. No. <laughs> <laughs> but at, at, at this point, it's all ambiguous. We don't know what's going on. Okay, back into the light. Any more? One, one here, yeah. Into the light. Hi, sir. Hi, sir. Um, Rob Zombie is known for his music as well. So I'm just wondering, were you ever a fan of his music, or has he turned you into a fan since you worked with him? I, li I liked his music. I, I never even met uh, Rob until we showed up for uh, the fitting for our wardrobe. Okay, uh, but I and people said, yeah, he's a he's a rock musician. You know, uh, uh, how's he going to be as a drag? I said, listen, what you are in one form of art is going to be what you are in, in any other form of art. Okay, his music is tight. Um, he does it right. And I have absolute confidence that he's going to be the same thing as a director, okay? And guess what? He was. So, that was that. Okay, uh, time for one last question. Uh, make it a good one. Um, anyone else? There's somebody up there. Yep. From the darkness comes a voice asking, Hey, Sid. Hello. <laughs> I'm hiding in the dark. Um, the scene where you were in the van in Devil's Rejects. Uh, seen it, seen in where I'm. In what? the van with the. Uh, oh yes. The tootie fruity. Yes. Tootie <laughs> fucking fruity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was that scripted or was that just you guys having a bit of fun? That was not scripted at all. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Rob was having a little problem with the scene and he just didn't like the way he had constructed it so we met in the office to try to work something out and he said, you know, he asked me what I was going to do and I said, I don't know, let's just do it and see what happens, okay? And so we were kind of roaming around and, and Bill Mosley said, there's no ice cream in your fucking future and I said, of course, I think I'm going to give me some tootie fucking fruity. <laughs> Rob fell off the couch, and we knew that was the line. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, sadly we've come to the end of our time here, but uh, um, we've had two, um, two half hours with Sid, and um, that's just not enough. It, it, to, to cover this guy's career would take the whole weekend, I think. So, uh, But um, uh, we've managed to get some marvellous, marvellous stories out of Sid. Um, and um, he's been in the business, as he says, for 56, 57 years now. Let's hope we've got many more years to come, many more great movies. It sounds like we have from what he says. So for now, will you put your hands together for Mr. Sid Hayes? Just one last thing to say, and those of you that were here yesterday have heard this, I'm going to say it again. If it was not for you, none of this would be happening for me. You make everything happen. You put a roof over my head, you put clothes on my back, you put food in my stomach, and I love you. Sit down.